Hello, everyone. Are you enjoying Amsterdam so far? Awesome. Cool. There are my slides. Nice. Um, yeah, so this uh, talk is about the ELS, the Ember language server. Um, if you have no idea what the, what the language server is, I hope by the end of this talk you have an idea. Um, a few quick words about myself. This is what I do when I don't sit at a computer. Um, you can contact me at these handles. Um, I work for Simple Labs for two years now. We are a small company in, uh, based in Munich and consulting all over Europe. Um, as we are based in Bavaria, I have some of these stickers with me. If you want some, come find me after the talk. Um, before we begin, a small disclaimer. Um, this talk contains a few code examples, but I've simplified them so that they can fit on the slide and are easier to digest. Um, I want to explain the concepts, not necessarily the exact implementation. Um, you can find the real code in uh, this repository, but it's not that different from what I'm showing you. So before we start, um, I want to do a quick survey. Who's using Vim? I can't see anything, but that's okay. Okay, quite a few. Um, Emacs, Woo! don't kill yourself, please. <laughs> or each other. Um, VS Code, everyone, probably, yeah, okay. Anyone on Atom? Okay, quite a lot. IntelliJ, WebStorm, et cetera. Okay, so quite a diverse group, that's good. Um, so me personally, I use IntelliJ. Um, I've been doing Java development a few years ago. I did some Android development, and when Google basically released their Android Studio IDE, um, I fell basically in love, and uh, I've been using IntelliJ since then. Um, and the problem is then I started doing Ember development. And the Ember support in IntelliJ wasn't that great at all. Like, there was no support, essentially. So what I did is um, I knew Java, and I knew that IntelliJ was written in Java, so I wrote an IntelliJ plugin for EmberJS, um, which is this one. Um, and it helped me navigate around faster, did auto-completion and stuff like that. Um, so, for example, stuff like this does play. It does play. Awesome. Um, so, basically, IntelliJ has this feature where you can press a keyboard shortcut and go to a specific class. Um, the problem is, though, with Ember objects, those objects don't have names by default because we don't write the name anywhere in the file. It's only the file name that matters. So, IntelliJ wasn't able to handle that properly. Um, so, that's one of the first things that I did for the IntelliJ plugin so that I could write the name of, say, a component, a model, a adapter, whatever, um, and it would autom automatically get me to that class. Um, the other thing I did was a go-to-definition feature. So I could click a name in the template, a, a component name in the template, and it would automatically take me to the right template or component definition file, and it would just be so much quicker to navigate around the apps. The main problem with that was it's IntelliJ only. Um, so people with VS Code, Atom, Vim, they don't get to take advantage of that. And well, that's not great. Um, the naive solution to that is we just write an add-on or a plugin for every combination of languages and editors out there. You can see with just four languages or frameworks and four editors, we're already up at 16 plugins. And you can imagine that doesn't scale well. Um, so it would be pretty awesome if we could do it like this. So we just write one plugin per language or framework and one plugin per editor, and they would all just work together in some way. And the good thing is that's not magic. It's just engineering, basically. We need a common protocol so that they can work together. Um, I've put down some examples here. You don't need to read all of them. It's okay. So basically how it works is this. Every usual Ember app is talking to some backend server, and that's usually done via HTTP, often via JSON API, um, and a language server works quite similar, like this. Um, you have the text editor as a client sort of thing, and the Ember language server, as the name suggests, as the server. Um, instead of using HTTP, it's using JSON RPC, which is a very simple, small protocol, and instead of using JSON API as the payload, it's using something called the Language Server Protocol, which is built on top of JSON RPC. And it looks roughly like this. Um, you can see at the top, we have some metadata about the protocol version, in this case 2.0. Um, we have a request ID. Then we have the method that is getting called in the, from, the, from the request and some parameters. 
And then the response from the server includes the same request ID and then a result or optionally an error. So pretty easy actually. Now the good thing is Microsoft released a package called VS Code Language Server that abstracts most of this completely away. So we don't even have to think about all the JSON RPC stuff because we can just use that NPM package and don't think about the communication. We can just focus on the business logic. So with that said, let's do that. Syntax highlighting. Um, unfortunately, I have bad news. That is not part of a language server. For some reason, Microsoft decided syntax highlighting is nothing a language server should do, and that is part of the editor. So now, well, every editor has to write it themselves. Whoops. Yeah. Well, let's focus on something else. Autocomplete. So we're going to build this autocomplete feature in a very simple way. So for now, we want to focus on just autocompleting the built-in template helpers that Ember provides us, stuff like action, um, concat, hash, query params, and stuff like that. Um, and we want to focus on the case where we autocomplete in a sub-expression, denoted by the parentheses around the A in this case. And this is the request that the text editor sends us. It includes the method text document completion. And then in the params section, you see that it includes the text document URI and the position where the caret is. So basically your cursor in the file with the line and the character number of that line. So that's all we get in information. So the first thing we need to do is we use the VS Code URI package to convert that URI to an actual file path. Don't worry too much about it. It basically converts stuff like um, question marks and hashes and stuff like that. Um, at the end, we get the file system path, and that's the important part. Next, we just read that file. We can use the build and FS module, for example. Um, then we split it by lines and split it by characters, and then we get A. So we know our character, uh, our cursor is at the character A. But that doesn't really help us because we want to know what that thing is. What is the A? It could be an A in an HTML tag, for example. So that doesn't really help us. So what we can do instead is there is this add glimmer slash syntax package. And we can pass the code from the file into the preprocess function that that package provides. And that produces an abstract syntax tree. Don't be afraid, it's not that hard. The next talk will also give you an introduction to that also. So, abstract syntax tree, it roughly looks like this. On the right side is the simplified version of the abstract, abstract syntax tree. I'm gonna call it AST now because it's shorter <laughs> and easier to pronounce. Um, so at the top we have the program node. That is basically your whole template, everything. And then the next node is just the one mustache statement, so the double curlies. You can imagine if you have multiple curlies, then you would have multiple nodes in that program node. The next child of the mustache statement is the path expression. And that is the name of the component or helper or context variable. And then also in the mustache statement is a hash. And that is the, basically that is all the attributes. Not, in this case, we only have one attribute. But you can imagine a component with five attributes. The hash contains all of them. And so each attribute is visualized by the hash pair node. Inside of that is a sub-expression with, with the parentheses. And then inside of that, another path expression. And that's the thing we care about. We want to do auto-completion for the path expression inside of a sub-expression. OK? Good. You might be wondering, how do I know all of this? And it's actually not that hard. There is this cool web app called AST Explorer, unfortunately written in React, but oh well. Yeah. Um, um, so a few months ago, I took some time and built Glimmer and Handlebar support into the AST Explorer. So it uses the same parser, the at glimmer slash syntax package, and you can pass in a template on the left side, and it would automatically show you the whole AST on the right side. And you can move your cursor around, it would automatically highlight the right nodes. It's really awesome um, to get an idea about how the parser actually th thinks about your code. All right, so we have this situation. We know the template, we know where the cursor is, and we have the AST. Now, how can we figure out what node we are actually looking at? Because right now, we only have a position, but not the actual node. 
The good thing is that each node in the AST, it includes location information, so a range of characters that it includes. So in this case, the A path expression, it starts at line five, column 18, and ends at line five, column 19, right? Now, with the position information that we have, line five, character 18, we can go through the tree starting at the program and figure out what node are we actually looking at. So we'll start at the program, figure it out. Okay, we are inside of the program. Then we go to the children, mustache statement. We're inside the mustache statement. We are not inside the path expression though. So we just drill it all the way down and we end up at the path expression. So what we know now is we are looking, the cursor is actually at the path expression node. All right? So I haven't included the code because it's a little longer, but that's basically what the find node at position method or function in this case does. We pass it the AST, we pass it the position that we get from the request, and we get back the node that is highlighted. Now, next thing is we need to actually filter out all the other cases. We are just interested in having a path expression inside of a sub-expression. All the other cases we don't care about. If that is the case, we can return the sub-expression helpers, which is just a static array, roughly like this. So the valid sub-expression helpers are action, component, concat, give, get, if, and unless. And all we need to do is convert them into completion items. And that is by wrapping them in an object with a label and the right kind so that they get highlighted, uh, suggested properly in PS Code, for example. So autocomplete, done. That was easy. Let's go for something else. Autocomplete step two. Um, Built-in helpers is, well, relatively easy. Now it's, get, it's getting more complicated. We want to autocomplete component names and not just the built-in components like link to and what's the other one? Input, for example, <laughs> text area too. Um, but we want to actually autocomplete your own components. So how do we do that? First thing we need to do is figure out where is your application. All we have is the path to the template. And we can use a package called findup, for example, to find the embassy lie build JS file that is closest to your template. And that is usually the case, the, the, the place where the root path of your application is. So in this case, it's the crates.io folder. Now, next thing we do is we use a glob package. There is fast glob. There are about a thousand million NPM packages for this. Just use anyone, anything. Um, we can use that package to find component files and template files inside of the app folder that you have. And with those, we strip the extension, we use array from and set to get a unique thing, because if you have a component file and a template file with the same name, you don't want to get it twice as a suggestion. So we need to, unique, uh, we need to do a unique operation. And then we just basically return it as a completion item again. And that's it, done, awesome. Next thing is go to definition. You might think this is a little bit more involved, but it's actually not. So this is the request that comes in. We get a de text document slash definition request in this case, instead of completion, but the parameters, they look basically the same. We get a text document URI, and we get a position with line and character, right? And so we're at this again. We have the template. In this case, it's a component with a param with, a, with an attribute. Um, but this case, in this case, we're interested in the path expression of the mustache statement, not of the sub expression. So next thing we do is filter again. This looks very familiar because it's essentially the same code, just with a different uh, parent type. You've seen this slide before, it's the same thing. Now it gets a little bit more tricky. Well, not tricky, different. Um, instead of iterating over all the components and templates that you have in your app, we just figure out, is that component available? Right? So we use the exists sync method in this case to figure out if in the project root, in the app components folder, there is a component matching the name that you have in your template, so the original well, the name of the path expression, essentially. Don't ask me why it's called original and not name, but that's a different discussion. Um, if we actually have that file 
Then we can add it to the results array and return that array, and then it will just be suggested to you. So what else can we build with this? There's lots of things. For example, link to. What we do here is we call the link to component and we pass it a route name. Now that route name defines a route, a controller, and a template usually. Some of that may be auto-generated, but those three things are the main components, basically. Well, not components. Components is a bad word. Modules. Um, so if we click on the index in this case, it could automatically take us to the index controller, the index route, or the index template. Right? And this is not just limited to handlebars. We can do the same thing for JavaScript. It's just a different parser and a different abstract, abstract syntax tree. Um, but in, in theory, the concept is exactly the same. Um, we figure out what we've clicked on, and we figure out, well, what could this mean? Do we have those files? And if so, we can just suggest it to the editor. So in this case, if we click on the relation name, it could take us to the adapter, the model, the serializer, and so on. Same is true for service injections, for example. Um, one more advanced thing is the T helper from Ember Intel and Ember IT&N. Um, you pass it the key to a translation. Um, what you could do is if you click that key, it could offer you all the translations in all the languages that you have. So you can immediately, from your template, navigate to the right translation and say Russian or French or whatever. Now, unfortunately, there are a few caveats. The main one for me personally, I've called compiler versus editor. A compiler must produce 100% correct output to work properly. But it can also expect that the input is 100% valid, and if it isn't, the compiler just says, nope, not gonna do it. An editor, on the other hand, um, it is allowed to produce incomplete results. For example, for autocompletion. Um, it's okay if it doesn't autocomplete everything, but most of it should be there. But the problematic part here is it should handle incomplete and invalid input. So when you're typing link to, for example, and you just stop and do autocomplete, the template is not complete, and the Glimmer parser can't handle that. So that is a major problem that we have right now with the language server, and we haven't found a good solution yet. If you have ideas, please come to me after the talk. We have some, some heuristics around it so we can work with the basic stuff, with the basic cases, but it's, it is a problem. So the Glimmer syntax package was written for the template compiler, not for editor support, and we kind of feel the problems with that right now. Um, the second problem is editor support. Um, well, in theory, you wouldn't need a package per editor, but in reality, you actually do. Um, so for VS Code, that is done. We have the VS Code-Ember extension that you can just install from inside the editor. It works, perfect. Adam, same thing. IDE Ember package, install it, should work. But then, well, Emacs, Vim, I don't know, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't use Emacs, so I can't help, but there are two people that are unfortunately don't here today um, that started working on Emacs integration, at least. I have no idea about Vim. For Emacs, for example, the problem is that Emacs right now can't handle multiple language servers per file. So you need to choose between using the JS, the JavaScript language server, and the Ember language server, and that is a hard choice. Well, actually, it's easy, but oh well. And I don't know about Vim, as I said. Um, and I want to close with, with a wish list of stuff um, that is unfortunately not yet supported by the language server protocol itself. And that is, for example, file type icons. Um, that is one of the first things that I built into the IntelliJ plugin. Um, you can see on the right side that all of these files are JavaScript files, but IntelliJ can figure out by the path what icon to use. So for models, for example, it uses this database icon. For routes, it uses the branch icon from Git. And that makes it very easy in the in tab, uh, uh, tab view at the top to navigate around and see what tab you're actually looking at, especially if all of them are named crate.js. Um, the other cool thing is go to related file. Um, so in IntelliJ, there is a, a keyboard uh, shortcut. So let's say we are at the crates controller and we quickly want to navigate to the route. I can hit that keyboard combination 
go down to the route that is just one key press away, press enter and I'm there. So I basically never use the, the file tree because it's just so quick to navigate around with the go to related file, go to class, etc. Unfortunately, as I said, that is not supported by, um, by VS Code and the language cycle protocol. But you could imagine all of this working, like you could cycle through controller route template, component to template, model adapter serializer, and also to the related test files. And then the other very cool thing is, I've stolen that idea from Android Studio, and they've, I think they've probably been the first ones. Um, you know about some editors where you can fold lines so that you don't have to look at all of the code inside if, in if branch, for example. Um, IntelliJ can do that in the same line, and they also have custom replacement characters, essentially. So it's not just replaced by an ellipsis or dot, dot, dot. You can replace it with anything if you're the plugin author. And what I did here was I looked for template for, for translation helpers and I replaced them with the actual English translation. So that if you open a template with translations, you actually see the right text, not just the, the translation helper. Now that's actually really helpful if you look at the template and see the text properly. Um, and I want to close with saying we need you, please help us. I only, I only use IntelliJ, I don't even use the ELS right now. So if you're motivated and want to work on this, I'm happy to mentor people. Um, and thank you. <laughs>